Thank you very much for this extremely interesting invitation. I think the environment, not only the natural environment, but the human environment here is quite extraordinary. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to start with a very brutal statement. Um, and it is that I believe <coughs> that neoliberal economics, which has conquered the entire world, backed by most politicians and corporate people, is killing more people than the armies put together. Let me give you just one terrifying, at least I consider it a terrifying figure. Starting in October 2008, when the big crisis began, uh, in about a few weeks, we reached about 17 trillion dollars to bail out and to save the speculators who had created the crisis. If you divide 17 trillion by the amount that FAO had indicated was necessary to overcome hunger in the world, which according to FAO was 30,000 million dollar a year, if you divide the 17 trillion by 30,000 million, what you get, please, is 600 years of a world without hunger. Where was that money? I worked with the United Nations many years with FAO and ILO. And I have never been a mainstream economist, but even so, I was honestly convinced that unfortunately there were not enough resources to really solve hunger in the world. And all of a sudden, I discovered that there was money for 600 years without hunger. Well, if that is not a scandal, I don't know what a scandal could be. Terrifying things are happening right now. The fact that, for instance, in Spain today, more people die because of suicide than because of traffic accidents is terrifying. And what's the reason behind that? What is happening with the so-called economy? And similar things are happening, of course, where suicide has increased dramatically, like in Greece and in Italy. But of course, we know what the recipes are that are given to those countries. The first was for Greece. Well, first of all, you have to <coughs> dismiss 250,000 people. Jesus, that sounds very simple. Eh? You dismiss 250,000 people, but nobody's thinking that you are generating 250,000 personal tragedies. But that has no value whatsoever in economics today. It's meaningless much more important than 250,000 personal lives is a macroeconomic indicator. And if that improves, ah, then everything is justified and everything is fine. Well, that is the context in which we're living, and it's within that context that I want to share what I propose and believe. The increasing concern about sustainability and its different approaches, interpretations, indicators, and strategies is the result of the way in which economics has evolved as a discipline. There is a direct correlation between sustainability as a preoccupation and the imposition of the neoliberal ideology as the dominant economic model. Before 1970, sustainability had not even emerged as a concept. Economics has obviously not always been the same. The development has been a succession of bifurcations between alternative visions with a clear tendency of always becoming dominant that alternative which best favors wealth and power. This we have dramatically demonstrated in the book Economics Unmasked. Neoliberalism is not only the culmination of such a tendency 
but it also represents, as we shall see, the death of true economics. Aristotle, in the introductory chapters of his politics, made a clear distinction between what he called oikonomia, meaning the management of the household, and krematistike, meaning the art of acquisition. Aristotle's oikonomia concerned domains related to the production and the reproduction of use values, such as agriculture, crafts, hunting and gathering, mining, and so on. Oikonomia embraced values, ethics, and aesthetics as fundamental conditions for the attainment of the final Aristotelic goal, which was the art of living and living well. There you have a beautiful concept of what the common good should be, to live and live well every day. Commerce, that is crematistics, being concerned with the art of money making, accumulation of exchange values through trade, was considered by the philosopher as secondary from logical and historical points of view. Exchange value had to logically be subordinated to use value. What we have today is exactly the opposite. What we call economics in our present world is in reality not economics but crematistics. Economics does no longer exist. Contributions have been made for the reconstruction of economics and are being made. Human needs, quality of life, values, well-being, sustainability, common good are of course inseparable parts of the art of living and living well. <laughs> Certainly, none of these have any relation to the neoliberal ideology concerned exclusively with growth and accumulation in monetary terms. The reconstruction of economics is a colossal change from what we have. If we want to change something, we must first, of course, understand the origins of that which we want to change. Neoliberalism, the late offspring of neoclassical economics, has become the political ideology that dominates almost all economic departments in our universities. In fact, it has been the universities that gave rise to neoliberalism and continue to be its enthusiastic promoters as the only definitive and respectable school of economic thought. I am therefore convinced that no significant changes can be expected in our world today unless the teaching of economics undergoes a deep transformation. Where does neoliberalism come from? The story begins almost a century and a half ago in 1870 when economists made it a case to demonstrate that economics was a science just as Newtonian physics. The most important economists of the time, <coughs> Stanley Jevons and Leon Valdras, were simply fascinated with classical mechanics. Hence, they had to develop a model that had similar properties with the model of the universe designed by Newton. Just as Newtonian physics proposed gravitation as a universal law describing the behavior of the universe, neoclassical economists had to devise a similar universal law capable of describing the behavior of human beings. I imagine how they must have been thinking like crazy, you know, every day and every morning, every night, what is the general law? Yeah? And finally, the universal law turned out to be utility, meaning that every human being always behaves and acts in such a way as to maximize his or her utility. Valras, in his Elements of Pure Economics of 1877, declares, I quote, the pure theory of economics is a science which resembles the physico-mathematical sciences in every respect. Fantastic. Hmm? The way of demonstrating this every respect was achieved through the imposition of fanatical mathematical formulations that have no relation whatsoever 
with real life economics. But look very impressive, of course. The neoclassical fabrication was successful enough as to be accepted as legitimate by the academic community. However, it coexisted with other visions which were considered as legitimate, like the institutional economics proposed by Veblen and others during the 30s and last of last century without disappearing. It was, it was offside, offsided by Keynesians, Keynesianism, yet continued to coexist with it as well as with other approaches like those proposed by the Marxians, other schools like post-Keynesians, Austrians, behaviorists, and feminists added their own contributions up to the late 60s. Up to then, students like me, I studied in the 50s, up to then, students like me had the possibilities of multiple perspectives when analyzing economic problems, and courses such as economic history and history of economic thought, now completely vanished from all the curricula, were absolutely fundamental in every department of economics. These courses are no longer being taught. Who wants to know what happened before? Now we have the eternal truth. Who is interested in what did this one or that man think? Or what woman thought? No interest whatsoever. The extraordinary thing about 19th century neoclassical economics in its neoliberal version is that it has achieved its final triumph in the late 20th century. This is amazing indeed. In fact, we no longer have a physics of the 19th century. No do we have 19th century biology or astronomy or geology or engineering anymore. All sciences have shown a permanent evolution. Economics is the only exception where problems of the 21st century are supposed to be interpreted, analyzed, and understood using 19th century theory. In a necrological impulse, mainstream economists of today look for guidance and inspiration in the cemetery of 150 years ago, as if nothing had happened ever since. This is preposterous, to say the least, and the fact that universities go along with it is an epi epi epistemological scandal of immense proportions. The conspicuous facts that during 2008 and 2009 have shown that the neoliberal doctrine is not then only wrong, but poisonous, seem not to disturb the mainstream economists that still control the immense majority of economics departments. If those economists, in the wake of the present global disaster, would at least slightly resemble the attitude of natural scientists, which they always wanted to look like, they would recognize and confess the inadequacy of their theories and proclaim the urgent need for designing or accepting new ones. Nothing of the sort is happening, and we still have, instead of economics, education, economics, indoctrination. <coughs> From the point of view of a normal academic mind, it is really difficult to understand how such an unreal, simplistic, and dogmatic intellectual construction has managed to seduce and even to convince academia, politicians, and the general public that the fantasy world from which its conclusions are drawn is actually the real world. In the neoclassical make-believe world, everything, like in a fairy tale, works wonderfully well. There is never any unemployment, markets of all kinds always clear instantly, everyone gets exactly what they deserve, market outcomes are invariably optimal, everyone maximizes their potential, and all citizens possess a crystal ball that infallibly foresees the future. In this axiomatic paradise, without messy things like social beings, institutions, history, culture, ethics, religion, human development, and the indeterminacy that always accompanies freedom, without all those messy things, there is no government, no ownership, no regulation, no corporate accountability, no building codes, no health and safety laws, no collective bargaining rights. 
no food standards, no controls on oligopoly and monopoly, no welfare, no public health departments, etc., etc. Instead, they are just markets. Markets, markets, markets. For those who take the model literally, the solution to all human problems is to make the real world more like the neoclassical make-believe world. All you need are markets. If you, can't, you get, if you can't yet get rid of something that is not a market, then make it look like a market. This is the central idea of neoliberalism. Simple-minded, of course, deluded totally, but it can be applied to virtually everything. This must come to an end, of course, because economists trained according to these fantasies end up being like the idiot of savant, geniuses when playing with mathematical symbols, but total ignorance about the real world in which they live. To continue promoting a poisonous ideology <coughs> disguised as science is suicidal. The cure is certainly not easy, but it has begun. The next step should be the awakening of economics departments and their willingness to offer, like in the 50s and 60s, the multiplicity of economic visions so that students can make their choices based on all the accumulated knowledge contained in the development of their discipline. The necessary creativity to understand the realities of our new century can only occur in the realm of intellectual plurality and freedom. What we have now are two parallel worlds, one mainstream, still anchored in the economics departments, immune to all messages and evidences that might bring about any change, and the alternatives, like the ones we discuss here, represented by people like us, dispersed all over the place, perceived by the mainstream as subversive, but still incapable of bringing about the fall of the neoliberal wall. Sooner or later, however, the wall will collapse. We are in the situation so lucidly described by the great physicist Max Planck over 100 years ago when he was faced with the orthodoxy of the Maxwellian physics, physicists. He said, I quote, a new scientific truth does not triumph but convincing its opponents and making them see the light but rather because the opponents eventually die. <laughs> and now a generation grows up that is familiar with it. The situation in which we are now is precisely that of a growing new generation waiting to attend the funeral of the official holders of the truth. I hope the funeral will be as soon as possible, of course. The fact that human needs, well-being, and quality of life, common good, are to become again the fundamental aims of sustainable development is encouraging indeed. It was in 1986 that the principles of human scale development and its human needs theory was proposed by me and colleagues and published by the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation in Sweden, in Spanish first and then two years later in English. It generated, to our surprise, almost immediate interest and enthusiasm, not only among, among alternative groups, but surprisingly, among many peasant communities in South America. We were really astonished when we realized that the original Spanish version became in those days the most photocopied document in the continent. We used to arrive in Andean communities <coughs> to be approached by local leaders with a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, almost unreadable, ready to discuss whether their interpretation was correct and whether their project satisfied the philosophy of human scale development. It was moving to witness how such marginal communities adopted the principles and designed development projects that conventional experts would have been unable to conceive. The first lesson that we learned from these experiences was that the language of human scale development and its needs theory can easily be understood by simple people 
who lack any formal education apart from a few years of primary school. The second lesson learned was that no true development can succeed without the understanding, participation, and creativity of the people themselves. The third lesson was that what mobilizes common people does not necessarily mobilize academics. In fact, what took the peasants almost no time to understand took about 15 years for human scale development to generate interest in the academic levels. Now it is finally in, and as human needs theory is recognized as one of the most important contributions in the field. Human needs, capabilities, quality of life and well-being is what people understand, not the abstractions of macroeconomic indicators that have nothing to do with real life. Development is about people, not about objects, and not about money. The fact that once again we are willing to rediscover and respect human feelings and the value of all manifestations of life means that a better world is possible. In a way, it feels like a fascinating voyage back to the origins. So why not finish this presentation with a little Aristotelian dream? Let us imagine that economics becomes, again, the manner of managing the household in order to achieve the art of living and living well respecting the right of all others to achieve the same and within the limits of the carrying capacity of our planet. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, my, my friend. Um, I have a question for you before we maybe take some questions from the audience. Because of lack of time, you were not able to summarize, it, of course, everything. Sir, could we now turn off this light so that I can see <laughs> the people, now that I don't have to read? Thank you very much. This one. Better now. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, human indicators. You know, today we have macroeconomic indicators such as GNP, and, uh, <coughs> and there are several movements now. The UN has started something. Uh, there's the, the people in Bhutan. They had uh, developed some type of indicator. And you mentioned some indicators in Barefoot Economics, I believe, or, and also in your latest book. Human scale development. In human scale development. Can you explain just briefly what these indicators are and how can these indicate? Are, are we going towards an adoption of these indicators, or are there today many different indicators? What is your view on that, because this is important, <coughs> take an important point. <coughs> well, of course, there are many indicators, but the point is what is a meaningful indicator. Um, but first, I would have to give a context for that, um, to see where in these indicators fit. And that is the type of economics which I would like to see in the world. And this is an economics based on five postulates and one fundamental value principle. And the postulates are, one, economics is to serve the people and not the people to serve the economy. Two, development is about people and not about objects. Three, growth is not the same as development and development does not necessarily require growth. Four, no economics is possible in the absence of ecosystem services. Five, the economy is a subsystem of a larger and finite system, the biosphere, hence permanent growth is impossible. And the fundamental value principle is that under no circumstances whatsoever should economics be above the reverence for life. If you take these fundamental principles for a new economy, then the indicators have to do precisely with those things. For instance, today, what does an economist conventionally uh, educated in a university today understand now about the natural world? What does he understand about the thermodynamic laws 
which are absolutely determinant for all the rest to occur. There is a total ignorance. In other words, you can conceive as they do, and the way they see the world, I mean, it fits. You can have growth forever. There's nothing that may limit it. And that's where my great master, in the olden days, Kenneth Boulding used to say, those who believe that permanent growth is possible in a finite world are either mad or economists. <laughs> no? And that's, of course, the way it is. And you make indicators you know about growth. Growth is a subject that this is in the press every day, in every discourse of every political and every uh, corporate uh, manager and whatever. You know, it's growth, 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 more growth. People don't realize that economic growth that after a certain point becomes uneconomic growth because the costs generated by, the, by that growth are greater than the benefits that it brings about. And we have demonstrated in studies that have been carried out in over 20 countries, mainly northern countries and a few southern countries, what we call the threshold hypothesis, and that is a very interesting indicator, which shows that in every society there is a period in which economic growth, conventionally understood, brings about an increase in quality of life. Quality of life. But up to a certain point, a threshold point, beyond which, if there is more growth, quality of life begins to deteriorate. And all the countries here in Europe have crossed that point. Even my country, Chile, has crossed that point in the end of the 80s. Hmm? Can you repeat the last point? Just what you said, what have we forgotten? What? what? What have we forgotten in Europe? You said something, but I didn't understand. No, what, what I say that in, in, in Europe has already crossed that threshold point oh. mm -hmm. in which economic growth generated Correct. greater quality of life. Mm -hmm. And now quality of life is deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And this has happened in, in, in the European countries, depending on which country, between the mid-70s and the late 80s. In those 15 years, practically all northern countries, you know, boom, have their threshold point. Now, how did we measure this threshold point? Well, we have the index of per capita growth, you know, which is published. Everybody knows it. And the other was an index generated by Herman Daly and John Cobb, originally called the Index of Sustainable Economic Welfare, which is the same as the Index of Economic Growth it is an aggregate index, but with one difference. What happens with the index of economic growth is a, a very funny thing. It seems that the people who invented it were not informed that there are four arithmetic um, uh, principles, you know, and they only knew addition. You know? They had never learned that there are other ones, you know, because everything is added in GDP. A big disaster with many dead, you know, whatever, in the main uh, road is very good for growth because it increases the consumption, you know, of doctors, of hospitals, of what have you, and mechanics to repair the cars that are destroyed. That's fine, no? Um, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So everything is added. In the other index, you have addition and subtraction. Everything that represents a cost to society is subtracted. Other word, in other words, the cost of that accident in this index is a minus, not a plus. Only the positive things are a plus. So if you have this index and you compare both, you have a long point, they're perfectly parallel. And then comes a point in which this continues and this <laughs> begins to go down. In some countries dramatically, like Great Britain, for instance, you know, probably all, all of Europe, the one where the decline was more rapid you know, than, than in ours. Now, well, we measured this before this crisis. I don't know, I mean, how it would look now. It might be absolutely uh, dramatic. So the indicators must be along those uh, principles, you see, which have to do with real life, which is where people really are. Thank you very much. So I think we will now take some questions from the room. There are some, uh, please announce yourself when you just say who you are, please, before you ask the question, and speak relatively loudly so we can hear. Thank you very much. You can ask in French. 
And then I will try to translate if some people don't speak English. I prefer in English with it. Oh, oh. Better. Yes. Okay. If possible. If not, I want somebody to translate. But my French is not very good. Yes. Well, good morning. My name is Christian Felber. I'm founder of the Economy for the Common Good, which is not known so far in English, but is spreading rapidly in from Germany Excuse to Spain. Me, if you would stand up, I can hear you better. Uh, that. Thank you I very much. I stand up or I speak up? <laughs> <laughs> I do both. I stand up and I speak up. Yeah. A co-founder of the Economy for the Common Good. In Spanish, maybe it's easier to understand, Economia del Bien Común, which is spreading um, over the last one and a half years. And we are especially focusing on the last question of uh, Mr. Um, Wasserman. And uh, my question is, it's uh, three parts of the question. Uh, shouldn't we call these new indicators success indicators and not only... Uh, shouldn't we call these indicators success indicators of the economy? Because if we know that the goals are different than monetary goals, the goals are life quality, the good living, um, ethical goals and satisfaction of basic needs, if these are the goals of economy, then the success of economy, um, in my vision, we should measure alongside the goals and not alongside the means. Because uh, GDP and the financial profit of a company uh, measure the uh, success of the company or of a uh, national economy alongside the means and not alongside the goals. But in any project, we agree that we have to measure the success of the project alongside the goal. So maybe the, the proposal is to talk about success indicators and not um, alternative or complementary indicators to GDP and financial profit. And the second part is have you developed an alternative to the GDP, which what? is, did you, de um, are you, and um, with human scale economy, are you um, developing an alternative indicator to GDP, which is really measuring all those goals uh, that you're talking about, the satisfaction of all the needs, and maybe the 2025 most important goals, that which is much more comprehensive than uh, the, um, the human development index, which is just, uh, composing three or four indicators. Yes, yes. And, and the most important part, um, what is the new success indicator of a company? Because if the financial profit doesn't measure the goal of a company uh, alongside the goals of the national economy, uh, what could be a different, a new, an alternative success indicator of, uh, on the microeconomic level of a company? Well, first of all, goals are long-term and <coughs> means are short-term. Um, but be careful about indicators. Not an indicator is not necessarily uh, a mathematical measure. Uh, <coughs> not everything can be mathematized or, or reduced to, to figures. Um, you cannot measure, have an indicator for ethics, you know, or for values. I mean, but we are obsessed we need to have, you know, a 2.356. Ah, that has meaning, you know, but if it's not something like that, no, 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 then it's not serious. Well, but that doesn't, that, that's not the way it, it should be. I mean, goals, I mean, you can, you see, <laughs> one thing, you know, that is becoming, strangely enough, uh, relatively popular in some economic areas is the concept of happiness now. Uh, some economists have recently discovered that happiness exists. No? And, and they, they have even published a couple of books about economics and happiness. I think about three or four books of them. It's a great discovery. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, now th the obsession of many is how do you measure happiness? Well, you don't have your I mean, If I look at your face, I know if you're happy or not. You see? If I ask you, well, I'm, uh, are you feeling better than last year or whatever, that's a good enough indicator for me. If people are happier, if they feel more realized, well, that means that developing is working. I don't need a concrete figure. Other things, of course, can be calculated. And the alternative measure to GDP is precisely the index I was referring to, which has a new name now. It's, it's the Genuine Progress Indicator because when it was first published uh, at in early 90s or late 80s 
by Daly and, and Cop. It was called the Index of Sustainable Economic Welfare. Many criticized it. I mean, there were positive criticisms with good suggestions, you know. They were taken in, and it was perfected. And it is now called the Genuine Progress Indicator, which is, as I said before, in the difference with GDP that has additions and subtractions. But all the components in that index have to do with human well-being. So that exists already. In, in ecological economics, there are enormous advances. The International Society of Ecological Economics, I'm one of its founders, no? the Journal of Ecological Economics and many books that have been published. Uh, I mean, all these mathematical problems have been solved. They are there. But it's just, I mean, that people really look at them, you know, and study and analyze them. I think all the answers are already there. But they don't penetrate the walls of the economics departments. That is still the problem. Nicola Michel, I think you have a question. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I really uh, was impressed by what you said. I think it's uh, very inspiring. But if, if you allow, I don't have for now a question, but I, I would like to uh, take a point that you make, uh, uh, made yesterday, uh, yesterday evening uh, about the, um, the role of man versus the role of life, or man, of human being. Yes. Um, and uh, where you said that, in fact, putting the uh, human being in the center um, is is uh, arrogant, and that what is uh, first comes first, and the priority yeah. is uh, is is life. Now, I think that this is an important argument that was made in the past decades, essentially by by people who uh, rightly so um, uh, defended uh, nature and supported the need for a broad uh, broader ecological uh, approach. Now. Uh, if, if you allow me, I think that one has to start here from the, the real cause of the crisis we're experiencing, which is, as I said yesterday, of an anthropological nature. So one has to start from who, the question, who is the human being? Who is the human person? Now, if the human person is the king of the creation that has the right to use and abuse the creation, then I fully share your view. This is a really arrogant uh, view of the human being. This anthropocentrism there must be uh, uh, reject, rejected. However, I think that if one conceives of the human being as uh, created, created uh, as part of the global creation, created by, by God as the whole creation was created by God. And I would like to add also, I don't have the exact expression in English, but created à l'image et à la ressemblance de Dieu. This anthropocentrism there is healthy. More than that, it, it is essential. Why? Because the human being in that context becomes co-creator, has the co-responsibility of the, the creation and has to behave accordingly. Uh, and if, if you allow, I, I just would like to, to add that in this context, life is, of course, absolutely essential. Even life with <coughs> capital L, it is this life that is creator. And this life is not separate from man. This, lives, this life uh, lives within the human being when the human person accepts to have this life within him or her. And this is, it is through this life that the human being becomes a responsible co-creator. So if you allow me, that's what I wanted today to say in support of what you said about life, in support of what you said about, about human, uh, about a false vision of uh, a human being an abuser of nature and creation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to tell you that uh, in 1995, a very interesting debate took place in the United States between two scientists. One was Carl Sagan, the famous astrophysicist, and the other was the papa, the great papa of the biologists in those days, uh, Ernst Meyer, who was 90 years of age. And the debate was about whether there is a possibility for the existence of intelligence life 
in other parts of the universe. <coughs> the argument of Carl Sagan was, yes, of course, there are an enormous amount of planets now similar to our planet, so essentially, I mean, there is no reason why there couldn't be intelligent life as such. <coughs> and the argument of uh, old Ernst Mayer was absolutely no. Why? This argument is a very fascinating argument. First of all, our world is 3,600 million years old. Um, when the first cell appeared, it took that cell 1,000 million years before it became a cell with a concrete, stable nucleus. It took that nucleus 1,000 million years. And then biology began. But the difference between biology and physics, physics is a linear thinking, and biology is full of thousands and millions of bifurcations. This first cell produced one little bacteria, you know, and that little bacteria reproduced and then generated another one, and there's another bifurcation and another one here, and more bifurcations here, more bifurcations here. So biological evolution is like a tree with thousands, millions and millions and millions of bifurcations, you know, where all the life forms eventually appear. Of all this, during almost 2,000 million years, one of these bifurcations, the one of the primates, you know, began also with its own bifurcations. You know. And of all this line, you know, of the primates, with all the, at the end, only 4% of that line turned out to be us. No? Now, imagine what that us is in this gigantic tree. It is in infinitesimally non-existent as a possibility. Um, but he went further, you know, and said, well, we appeared 300,000 years ago, no? First, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, uh, Neanderthal, Homo sapiens, etc., etc. So we are just in the last microsecond, you know, of an enormously long life. But he went further and said, um, this is extremely difficult that it may happen again somewhere else, you know. It's just simply too complicated. You know? But even more, he said, superior intelligence was a lethal mutation. Why a lethal mutation? Because it generated the only species of the millions of millions and billions that exist that is capable of willing and willing to destroy itself and all that surrounds it. No other species has that. And that is a colossal, lethal mutation, a colossal mistake of nature, and nature does not commit the same mistake twice. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> we are running a little bit out of time, but we'll take one last question, Beatrice, but very okay. short, please, and then Mer we will have Merci. to finalize. Thank you. If, if, if I may, uh, I'd like to speak French, and perhaps one could give a um, headphone to the speaker. Je, Beatrice Bourgeois, where are you? Because I don't see you. Okay. Ah, you are there. Well, please translate for me, because I, I will not understand. Je suis secrétaire Beatrice Bourges. OK, Beatrice Bourges, I'm the General Secretary of Entreprise and Progrès, which is a foundation which uh, um, reflects upon the, uh, together with the entrepreneurs. And I would like to come back to the value, which would be an alternative to financial value, because we, in our foundation, we are um, discussing this, and we have come up with a different uh, set of values, which is a long-term value, which we called uh, the entrepreneurial value. And entrepreneurial value is uh, uh, not a short-term value, but which is based on a number of indexes and uh, uh, leads to the entrepreneurial value in an ecosystem. So it is not only the external system, everything that is put out by the company, 
and also its internal ecosystem, meaning everything that is being produced within the uh, company when it manages to place man at the center. And uh, we're still discussing this. It is a research project. We have just published a uh, um, publication on this topic. And there are a number of companies who, which have agreed to establish uh, this uh, index and use uh, a terminology which is different than the financial terminology to compute this uh, value. And thus, the company can become richer. And I'm not talking in financial terms thanks to this uh, value. Because uh, uh, Beatrice is the Secretary General of a network in France called Entreprise et Progrès, which is doing some research work on, on indicators. And she explained, but I think it's good that you then discuss directly what this indicator is, what is this entrepreneurial. And, and there she's working with some different companies to try to define this, in the, in very much along the lines of what you have explained. So I'm not going to be able to translate ex everything Beatrice said. Martin, I'm sorry for the last question. We will have, you will have to get together with, with Manfred because we're running five, ten minutes late. And I would like to thank, uh, please, a warm round of applause.